back once again with another monitor review. This time we've got two in one. This is BenQ's EX2710 and the EX2510. And this is their model that they're calling the Mobuzi. Wait, no, they're calling it the Mobiez. <laughs> I'm calling it the Mobuzi. And when I spoke to them about this, they said it's Mobiez. And I'm thinking to myself, th there's no E there. How can it be Mobiez? Last time I checked, like, that's not how English works. And then they said, look, it's Mobiez. So this is where you guys can let us know in the comments, do you think it's Mobuzi or do you think it's Mobiez? And with that aside, we've got these two right here. There is a big difference, one big difference, well, two big differences between them, why I'm gonna be strongly, and I mean thoroughly recommending the 25 inch EX2510 over the 27 inch, the EX2710. And we'll get straight into that. And that's because of the brightness. The 25 inch, when I was measuring it, it had a higher brightness level. And this was to the tune of 335 center versus 291 on the 2510. Then over to the 2710, that had a maximum of 253 nits and a minimum of 214 with a 16% variance. So not only did the 2710 have a worse variance, but it had a significantly lower maximum brightness. And now this is important with this monitor because the motion blur on this model in particular is easily the best implementation of motion blur I have ever seen on any monitor come through here on the studio. Basically, it's using what's called black frame insertion. And when you couple this with AMA turned on, that's essentially BenQ's overdrive setting. There's four levels here, zero, which is off, one, which is a light, two, which is medium, and then three, which is strong. You would want to have this on either one, two, or three. There's not a huge difference between all three of those settings, but zero, having it off is not recommended. Where I was measuring double overlay of frames as opposed to one, which was scoring around seven milliseconds, two was getting around six, and then three was getting around five to six milliseconds. So I personally like to have this on the maximum AMA setting, the overshoot and purple fringing wasn't noticeable in games for me personally, and it wasn't noticeable when I was doing the UFO tester. But when you turn on this motion blur reduction, the brightness of the monitor drops. And so that's why it's important to have a brighter monitor out of the get-go when you turn on blur reduction. And so I thought the 2710 just didn't have that comfortable brightness level when we're turning this motion blur reduction on, as opposed to the 2510 having more brightness it looked better. And I was like, wow, for an IPS panel, 16 by nine, they're both 1080p as well, 144 hertz refresh. I was just blown away by how sharp and crisp the image was in fast motion with these settings turned on. Now, they do support G-Sync and FreeSync. I think it's FreeSync Premium as well. So 48 hertz to 144 hertz. And on the AMD side, you'll also get low frame rate compensation. Now, the trick is to getting these sync technologies to work is you, I found here in the studio, I had to use the DisplayPort cable. So they only included an HDMI cable. So if you wanna get FreeSync or G-Sync working properly on these panels, I'd suggest going out and buying a separate DisplayPort cable individually. And in future iterations, I'd like to see BenQ include a DisplayPort cable. So once you do that, you can then turn on these syncing technologies. But if you wanna keep the blur reduction on, which I do heavily recommend, you will then lose the option to turn on the syncing technologies or the adaptive sync. Though here's where things keep getting better for the Mobuzi in that the input lag is some of the best I've seen here in the studio. I'd peg it close to zero milliseconds or as close to zero as possible. But what about colors and what about the sRGB mode on these panels right here? Here's where this was very color accurate and I was surprised for a monitor that's coming in as an entry level IPS panel the sRGB mode was very accurate when I put the color brader on these panels, on both of them. And so if you wanna edit videos or you wanna edit photos on a budget, this monitor is definitely gonna double down to be able to do that, where there was only some very slight differences. Though speaking of color modes, they've got a few to choose from there. My personal favorite, at least for playing games, was just to smash it into the FPS mode, turn the AMA up to three, and then turn the blur reduction on and you'll have happy days. Though there are some other modes there, some of them feel like they were just quickly tacked together. 
to from a guy in the you know in the lab was just like yo i've got to add some more modes in this to differentiate and then they just tacked on some some funny ones in there though we just said the word tack and this is where they've tacked on this hdr button and this is pretty much my only critique of this monitor in today's review where the hdr i button you press this and essentially it's just some extra color modes where they're essentially just going to up the contrast, up the saturation, except in this case, it doesn't work that well. I prefer the other color modes, especially the out of the box colors are better in my opinion than pressing this button right here, which we can do now. And you just see here, the blacks just completely go, they're gone. Same with all the other modes. And so just leaving it off is the best choice in my opinion. Then the actual HDR itself in Windows 10. This is, again, these are 8-bit panels. To get true HDR, you want 10-bit. And so when you turn this on, this setting in Windows 10, this is straight away to tell if your monitor supports HDR or not, just like I said in yesterday's video with the 49-inch with its HDR. It's the same thing. You turn this on in Windows and you just get a beautiful washed-out image. And in fact, I think Windows need to change this to WODR or washed out dynamic range because that's what it is on 8-bit panels. And of course, part of me putting myself in the shoes of the customer always, I get this, I get why these companies want to market HDR, but I would think a much more successful button here would just be gaming in bold letters, have the button there and it changes it to the FPS mode instantly and the other modes that actually do really well. Now, in terms of the OSD, this is phenomenal. BenQ have put the D-pad in here. You can navigate the menu system really quickly, change your settings, and it's just a breeze. The OSD is set up like magnificently well. BenQ don't need to change anything on this monitor in terms of the OSD. It works, works well. It's got all the features. You've even got the quick menu feature, which you can customize and add in your own settings that you use regularly and change them on the fly. Though there's the black equalizer setting. And I know a lot of people do weigh this up, especially if they're playing competitive FPS games and they don't like the shadows. This is where the black equalizer works extremely well on this monitor too. So that's another good point where you can turn this up and it actually focuses on the darker areas. And they have added another option in called light tuner, which it works in other modes. So they're essentially the same thing, except I think light tuner just gives you the option to go the other way and make the darker areas darker if you want to. So kudos to BenQ for doing a great implementation of the black equalizer. And then the last two things to go over is the cross hatching, which there was no visible cross hatching when I pulled up an orange background. It's got a semi matte coating. It's a great balance if you're doing work and gaming, especially which this monitor is capable of doing. And then as for backlight bleed, I noticed no visible or obvious backlight bleed on either of these panels. So especially on an IPS panel, you do have to be careful of this. And for what it's worth, they've done a very good job of keeping that under control. And then for physical attributes of this monitor, it is height, swivel and tilt adjustable, 120 mil on the height and vertical adjustment. However, you cannot rotate the display. It does include speakers, but they are tinny. I do suggest if you're serious about audio, getting some proper speakers, or of course, a separate set of headphones. And then for inputs, we've got two HDMI, one display port, and the AC power, which the power brick is inside the monitor itself. And it's VESA mountable, though if you are using a stand and you want a flush finish that goes straight to the screw hole, then the max stand size will be 120 mil in a square format. After that, you will have to use extended screws. And with all that out of the way, it's now time to talk about these two monitors right here. And straight away, I'm gonna say, like I said in the intro, going for the 2510 over the 2710. And it wasn't just the brightness thing, it was the brightness thing coupled with what I believe is you're gonna to wanna to turn on some of the best blur reduction that I've ever seen, and it's gonna do a great job. But then, because you've got that extra brightness, the blur reduction is gonna work a lot better on the 2510. The second thing, and probably the best thing, is the price. The 2510 is coming in at 249 USD, in Australia, it's coming in at 379 Aussie dollars. And then for the 2710, 299 USD and 439 Aussie dollars. So you can not only save some money, but get a better gaming experience by going with the slightly smaller option. 
Now, in terms of competition out there, the nearest that I can think of or the closest that I can think of is the AOC 144 Hertz IPS panel. Now that's coming in at 180 USD and in Australia around 300 Aussie dollars. That thing is really good value for money. I'm not gonna beat around the bush and say otherwise. That's a phenomenal value for money entry level gaming monitor, especially if you want 144 Hertz. Though I feel like this with its, if you wanna pay the premium for this, you're going to get that motion blur reduction and it's going to work extremely well. Plus the sRGB color profile is very accurate too. So this has some extra things going for it that I feel make it a good purchase. And after gaming on this thing, I can easily say that the 2510 is a really good gaming monitor. You're gonna have an absolute blast, especially if you wanna copy paste my settings that I talked about in today's review. This one's definitely gonna be one to consider. Me personally, knowing how good this motion blur reduction works, I would be going for this. And trust me, I'm gaming on OLED, which has got sub one millisecond response times. And this works extremely well. Very surprised, very good implementation. Anyhow guys, with that aside, do let us know in the comments section below what monitor you are rocking currently. And with that aside, we have here the question of the day which comes from a friend, Rocket Jump Ninja. And they ask, what's with the ugly mic? And here's the thing, Zai. Let me tell you about the ugly microphone. In time, this microphone, you guys, if I take this microphone away, you guys are gonna be begging for it to come back. You're gonna be like, oh man, I miss the ugly microphone, please. The ugly microphone, <laughs> over time, is gonna grow on you. And not only that, I think the sound quality, at least from what you guys were saying, Sounds really good. So let's give the ugly microphone a chance. Hope that answers that question and I'll catch you guys in another video very soon. If you have any questions or comments about either of these two monitors, then be sure to drop a comment in the comment section below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. With that aside, peace out for now. Bye. Bye.